Hi, and happy Florida Climate Week. My name is Heaven Campbell. I'm with Solar United Neighbors. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that helps share education and focuses on consumer protection for going solar. So I'm excited to share with you today a Solar 101 webinar and explain how we do our work and some best practices for investigating going solar in Florida. As I mentioned, we're a 50C3, we're vendor neutral, and we help people go solar, join together, and fight for their energy rights. Our theory of change is pretty simple. We think that whenever you go solar and join together with your neighbors, then you have a vested interest in fighting for your energy rights, whether that's net metering or HOA access laws, or whatever it may be, better financing even. Uh, we think that joining together and creating a movement of people who are interested in supporting or solar owners is the best way to move us in the clean energy revolution. We got started in 2007 in Washington, DC. Our founder and executive director to this day, Anya Schoolman, wanted to go solar on her own home. Her son saw an inconvenient truth and got really fired up and really encouraged his parents to take that step. And she asked his um, best friend and him to go and share the things that she was learning about going solar with their neighbors. So it took a couple of years, but slowly but surely around 40 of those neighbors in the Mount Pleasant um, district of Washington, D.C. went solar together in the first ad hoc co-op. In 2015, an amazing volunteer who's now on our advisory council for Florida heard about our story on NPR and was so excited to bring this to Florida, she began calling our D.C. office. We had expanded from D.C. into the Mid-Atlantic and um, up to Ohio, and we're becoming a national organization at this point. Um, but Florida was definitely a big thing to tackle. It is to this day our biggest and brightest state. We officially launched our program here in Florida in 2016. And now fast forward to 2022, and we've had over 70 co-ops across the state of Florida, from Pensacola down to the Keys. We have members of our organization, of our nonprofit in all 50 states. Um, and Hawaii and Puerto Rico. We've launched hundreds of co-ops around the nation and helped um, over 7,000 people, 7,000 families go solar, including some small businesses too. So this is our national impact. We're really proud of the work that we do because we really are helping just average everyday people go solar. In Florida, as I mentioned, we've had over 70 co-ops across the state. We've helped over 2,000 families go solar. And this is about 22 megawatts of solar spread across our state. And this is really local power. So it's super exciting. Today, this webinar is gonna focus on helping people get acquainted with the basics of solar, solar technology. What are we talking about here? And then looking at solar economics, including some exciting recent changes. And then finally, our programming and how we work to help more Floridians go solar. So diving right into solar technology, this is definitely the heaviest section of this webinar. So I'm gonna go slow and go over some commonly asked questions as well. First, let's talk about how solar panels work. Whenever we talk about solar in Florida, we're talking about solar photovoltaic or solar PV. This is the glass looking panel that you see in this picture here. And that is a technology that converts photons from the sun into raw electricity. We are not talking about the meshy looking panels, um, a screen or mesh look with black PVC piping that is used to heat pools. This technology is called solar thermal that's been around in Florida for decades. So you will see a lot of that as well. We're talking about solar PV though. 
There are three main components to your solar system or your solar array, as it's also called. Uh, the first is obviously the panels. Panels are very heavy duty. Um, they're made out of tempered glass and an aluminum and stainless steel frame. Um, behind that is going to be the panel itself and the solar cells, which have silicon in them. And silicon gets excited when exposed to photons from the sun and creates um, you know, excitable electrons and raw direct current energy. Behind that, you're going to have a strong back sheet and a junction box, which is where you'll connect your um, microinverter, and we'll talk about that in a second, or uh, wiring to go down to your string inverter. A panel is also called a module. Panels are about three by five foot, uh, size of a coffee table, if you will, and they weigh between 40 and 50 pounds. Um, they are, again, heavy duty, no moving parts, so very little maintenance. Uh, the glass does pretty much self-clean with the amount of rain that we get here in Florida. If you have a ton of pollen at your house, like your car turns yellow during high pollen season, uh, then you may want to just check on your panels, look up there, no need to get on your roof and see if they're turning yellow too, and then give your installer a call if that is happening. But generally, panels wash clean um, from the rainfall that we get here in Florida. Panels are wind rated for down pressure, um, sometimes called snow load on the panel specification sheet. Um, they're also rated for uplift and hail. They have temperature coefficients for their best operating temperature. And many of them have um, salt spray ratings as well. So that's something that you want to look for if you are coastal. This picture to the right of the screen is a solar array or solar system. This is a ground mount system. Um, you can tell from the cement that there can be extra uh, equipment and installation protocols for ground mounts. So those do tend to cost a little bit more than a roof mounted system. We see both all around the state. And that gets us to that extra equipment, the racking. How does it attach to the ground or to the roof? This is the second most important component of your system. Um, this example here is what the majority of us would be looking at. The majority of us have single roofs and we would be looking at a racking system that has these tiny black boxes that you can see here, and that's called flashing. Flashing is actually a very common weatherproofing methodology that's used for satellite dishes, attic vents, plumbing vents, all of the things that we already put on our roof um, that penetrates our roof often use flashing as well. And this just helps seal up that penetration point. Um, solar does, the racking system does go into your roof trusses and flashing is not the only thing that's used. There's usually two to three different methodologies used to make sure it's um, water tight. Flashing, O-rings, um, and some type of foam or other sealant are all very common. The racking system itself is also rated for wind and engineered for, for Florida. And then the panels, as I mentioned, and then the whole system all together, how it is you know, engineered to fit on our roofs, how far back from the edges it is, all of that goes through strict Florida engineering per our Florida building code. And then also your local um, authority having jurisdiction or permitting or building department. So we see some of the strictest wind code requirements in South Florida, um, some of the strictest in the nation, which is to be expected. The racking system, um, as I said, is penetrating for a single roof. There are racking systems for pretty much any roof type. Uh, barrel tile roofs usually have a tile replacement system, which is a really unique type of system that helps ensure weatherproofing for that type of roof. And then standing seam metal actually has really cool tension systems that are non-penetrating called S5 clips. If your roof is at the end of its lifespan, so you have, let's say, 
seven or less years left on your roof, then you may want to consider re-roofing at the time of going solar. Because solar is so long lasting, it's warranted to last for 25 to 30 years and will last much longer than that. You do wanna be thinking about potentially um, re-roofing so you don't have to take those panels down, take all of this system down and then reinstall it. Um, that can definitely be an added cost and an added contractor that you need to work with um, to get that done. So consider re-roofing. Um, solar does expand the life, the lifespan of the sol the shingles that it's covering because it takes off some of that sun bleaching and wear and tear from the sun um, and covers those shingles. Here's an example of a standing steam metal roof and that um, a tension because this is a flat roof system as I described. Here's an example of concrete barrel tile. The last part of our system, the third most important component um, is an inverter. So there are really two types of inverters, a string inverter, which is about the size of a laptop or a speaker box. And that's going to be located next to your main panel inside of your garage or on the outside of your home next to your meter. And that is um, a very common type of inverter. The second type of inverter are microinverters that are located at the panel level on your roof. That's the example on the right hand side. And then in the middle, we have a hybrid, which is a string inverter. You will have that box still, but with DC optimizers. So optimizers operate like microinverters. They go on the panel level. So what's the difference between a string inverter and a microinverter? A string inverter is um, most commonly used for commercial and ground mounts. We still see it in residential all the time though. So no, no issues if that is something that you have or you're looking at. And that's kind of like a one lane highway in that all of your panels are gonna come together on one string, if you will, and send all of their electricity to this box. Uh, that can cause some traffic jams going with that highway analogy. If one panel happens to be shaded or underperforming, it can kind of slow down the flow of everyone. So a good uh, compromise is this hybrid option in the middle. DC optimizers go on each panel and help to clean up the flow of electricity and optimize um, the flow from each panel. So you're getting the most bang for your buck from each panel. And then uh, microinverters are the other option here. And microinverters are really key if you have any shading whatsoever. So they help to clean up the flow of electricity. Each panel is able to you know, operate at its best self. And something that you get with both that hybrid option, uh, string inverter with optimizers and microinverters is the ability to um, see each panel's uh, performance. So you'll see that through something called monitoring, which is going to be offered to you via your in inverter um, company. The manufacturers all have monitoring portals where you can see the monitoring of your system, the performance of your system in real time. And um, most offer really nifty apps that are a ton of fun to use um, or a desktop site that you can log into and just kind of see how everything's operating. Now, if you have a string inverter, you may only be able to see your whole system and its operation. If you have the optimizers or microinverters, you should be able to see each panel's operation. That can be really helpful for troubleshooting any underperforming panels or um, shading that has popped up, maybe some pre trimming is due. So the, the last component here is something we all already have, our main electrical panel for our home. Solar connects right into your electrical panel. And generally, if you have a home that was built after 1978 or has been brought up to code, then this is a pretty simple connection. Uh, we recommend at least a 200 amp panel. That's something that your electrician or your solar installer will be able to make sure you have. And um, you generally won't need any upgrades if that's the situation that you're in. If you do need upgrades, um, it's for the best because you may need to be brought up to code 
Um, you may have some fire hazards in there from old breakers, and it will create more room for your electrical panel. Starting in January of 2023, there is actually going to be a tax credit that's available through the Inflation Reduction Act um, that will help um, offset the cost of updating your electrical panel. Whether or not you're going solar, that is available. Some important uh, terminology to have top of mind when investigating going solar or you know, as a solar owner, solar is measured in, the system itself is measured in kilowatts. So each panel is usually between you know, 250 to 400 watts, and then together they'll make a system or an array that is expressed in kilowatts. So this example here is a 4.2 kilowatt um, solar system, and each of these panels is 350 watts. So you don't measure your solar system by the number of panels. A panel can be the same size. You can have two panels next to each other that are the same physical size and look pretty similar, but have different wattages based on how many solar cells they have inside of them. The production that your system is estimated to have is going to be measured in kilowatt hours. So on a proposal or a contract, you should see an estimated production um, usually expressed monthly or per year in kilowatt hours. And that matches what we see on our electricity bills as far as our consumption in kilowatt hours. The average size system is nine kilowatts um, for our Florida co-op, that's what we have found to be an average size system. But the size of your system does not actually um, matter when it comes to your home size. It is based on your consumption of electricity. So a lot of people will ask us, hey, I have a 2000 square foot home, what size system do I need? That's actually not a good measure of um, what size system you're going to need. The best way to figure out what size system you will need is to look at your utility bill. And some utility bills have a historical usage on them that will tell you, you know, over the last year, you've used X amount of kilowatt hours on average. Some you would have to look back at past bills. Most of the time you'll be able to log in online or call and request past bills and be able to um, calculate your annual historical usage. That is how you find out what size system you need. You wouldn't want to match the size of your system and its estimated annual production to your annual consumption. And you can do that at 100% if you would like to completely offset your consumption, um, or you can do that at maybe 50% if you just want to you know, stay under a tiered billing rate or um, help with those summer summer bills. So solar is a good payback, even if you don't do 100% offset. This is a very important slide uh, because a lot of people don't know that it really matters um, how much shading you have because uh, we are, you know, talking about solar collectors that are collecting the sun's photons, right? So the most important um, part of thinking about putting solar on your roof is thinking about your roof's orientation, shading, and space. So I like to call this the three S's, um, south, shading, and space. South is definitely the best um, for where we're situated on, the, on our spinning planet. In some cases, you know, if you think I have no shading whatsoever, I have a lot of space, I really want to know if I can, you know, maybe put a little bit on this, a uh, couple panels on the south, and then get away with some east west um, exposure as well, then you can have an installer come out and give you a quote. Um, if it's a really tricky project, they might even do some sun mapping of how the sun hits your roof. But um, you can definitely get away with a flat roof in Florida. Some northern exposure will work, but generally that's not gonna be the first place we look. We're gonna to look to the south, then the east, then the west for exposure um, to be able to put panels to collect some photons. And then shading, little or no shading. If you have any shading whatsoever, 
you really want to be considering microinverters so that you are getting the most bang for your buck. And then last but not least, space. So we say as a good rule of thumb, you want to have 200 square feet of uninterrupted space. So no um, roof fence, no uh, you know, solar tubes or um, chimneys, decorative items. So 200 square foot of uninterrupted space, the best rule of thumb. You can get away with multiple roof planes, um, but that's something that you want to start looking at uh, getting an installer out there to give you a, a really good quote for. So again, going back to that important terminology, we've got our solar array or solar system on this roof. In this example, your inverter is where all of that electricity is going to go first and foremost. And that's because, as I said earlier, um, this is very simple technology. The sun's photons are shining down, hitting that silicon, electrons are getting excited and creating raw electricity, which is in direct current. Our homes use alternating current electricity. So we're going to use that inverter to convert that electricity from DC to AC. And then Number three, our stop here is our own electrical panel, which means it's going straight to our home. See how it powers that light bulb? We are going to consume our solar power internally in our home first and foremost. You'll be able to see that production, and in some cases, depending on the type of inverter you have and the type of app that you have, um, you will be able to see your own consumption of your electricity that you've produced as well. Um, but this all happens in what we call behind the meter. So this is your knowledge that you say, okay, I'm looking at my monitoring. I've produced um, 45 kilowatt hours today. And you, know, you may or may not be able to see how much you've consumed in your own home. We do encourage consumption monitors. They're a lot of fun and they're a really good way to control you know, where you're using your electricity. But that's going to happen, you know, on your home side. Anything that you're not using, let's say it's 2 p.m. on a Tuesday and you're actually working in the office, the sun's beaming down, you're producing a lot of electricity, but your thermostat's at 78 and you're just not using a lot in your home at that time. Then any excess that you're not using in your home will go to number four, your utility meter. Your utility owns that meter. They will come out whenever you hook up your solar system and they will install a bi-directional meter that is capable of flowing both forward and backwards. And if you send excess, again, 2 p.m. on a Tuesday, you're not home using energy, you send excess back to your utility, your meter will flow backwards and it will register how much you send them and that will be a credit on your bill. That is um, a billing methodology called net metering. So whenever you send that backwards to your utility, that's all they know about. They don't know what you've used in your own home. Um, that's important because a lot of people expect them to know that and want to see that on their bill. You can only see that on your monitoring though. So you send that back um, to the wires and poles as you see here through your utility meter, you get a credit on your bill. Your utility, as soon as it hits you know, outside of your home, their wires, they count that as theirs now. You've shared it back with them and then they sell it to your neighbor at full retail price. So this is just a, a deeper explanation of what I've said here. You know, you use um, your own energy first and foremost, and then that bi-directional utility meter measures what you take from them. So what you're using, let's say 8 p.m. at night, your solar system is no longer producing because the sun has gone down you're using kilowatt hours from your utility. They're gonna measure that and that's gonna be a line item on your bill. And then you'll see a line item for that credit if you've sent back anything. And that is the billing methodology called net metering. So as I said, uh, we highly encourage consumption monitors. I have one, I think they're a ton of fun. Um, it's a very simple and relatively inexpensive um, tool that you can put on your main panel and it tracks, you know, your consumption in your home. So you can see what you produce on your roof. And even if you don't have solar, you can install one of these. And then you can see what you're consuming within your home. So some of the things that you can tell from this is 
uh, hey, I, I should maybe consider washing my clothes with cold water rather than hot and see the difference in kilowatt hour usage. Or my fridge is really pulling a lot and I don't think that's normal. My fridge is also 12 years old. Maybe I wanna look into um, some upcoming sales or Energy Star rebates so that I can get a more energy efficient fridge or hot water heater. Here in Florida, having a variable speed pool pump and a hybrid hot water heater are two of the biggest bangs for your buck when it comes to energy efficiency. Here's an example of a solar home. Um, so this is both the production and this has a consumption monitor um, as well. So you can see the behind the meter full picture. You can see on the left-hand side um, that they've produced 27 kilowatt hours. They consumed 14 kilowatt hours right on the spot and then they exported or sent excess back to the grid of 18 kilowatt hours. We're here to help you understand your electricity bill. Uh, we have some examples from the major utilities around the state of both pre-solar and post-solar utility bills that we can help you dig through. Um, this is a very, you know, very straightforward example of not a real utility bill, but some line items that you can expect to see. You, know, you can expect to see the electricity that you used from the grid, so imported or sent to customer or some common things that we see on utility bills, and then exported or excess or credit. Um, you'll see that as well. And this is a really simple formula for net metering. Let's say you use 300 kilowatt hours from your utility, you sent them 200, you're gonna be billed for 100 kilowatt hours. You will always pay a customer charge or a monthly grid connection fee. Uh, they have different names that they're called. Um, and then Duke Energy and Florida Power and Light also have a minimum bill uh, that you have to hit. Duke's is 30 and Florida Power and Light's is um, $25. So if you have a bill that with the customer charge, let's say your Duke customer charge is $11 and some change, and then you didn't use enough kilowatt hours to get to a $30 bill, they will just bump you up to that minimum bill. So you will always pay taxes and fees as well. Um, I think that it's important to note that even if you don't go 100% offset, most of our uh, utilities here in Florida have something called tiered billing. And that means you get charged a certain amount for using zero to 1,000 kilowatt hours. And then if you're using more than 1,000 kilowatt hours a month, you get charged a higher amount, a higher amount on the kilowatt hours, as well as your fuel surcharge and those some of those other fees. So even just getting to a point where you're saving off um, enough of your bill and you're, you know, creating and using your own energy enough to keep you under that tiered billing can be really impactful economically. Now we're going to talk a little bit about um, some additional system components like batteries. And it's really, really important for us in Florida to know that whenever the system, the grid goes down, um, so whether that's because of severe weather, like a hurricane, or maybe a car accident, a car hit a pole, um, your solar system is going to shut off immediately, within seconds. You don't have to press any buttons or pull any levers. It's called a rapid shutdown. It's required by the National Electric Code, and it is one of the reasons that solar is so incredibly safe. Uh, solar is not a hazard to linemen because you will immediately separate from the grid and shut down. So uh, that can be inconvenient because now your solar system is not producing uh, because the grid is down, but it keeps line men safe because they need to know that all lines, all down lines are dead lines and don't have any power being backfed from, um, from solar systems. So if you want access to your solar system when the grid is down, you are going to need a battery system or some type of storage solution. 
We see most people choose battery systems because of medical needs. Um, so having um, necessary medical equipment like an oxygen tank or a wheelchair lift or a CPAP machine at home or the need to keep medicine cold. Um, we also see a lot of people who have uh, wells and don't want to be without water choose battery systems. And then people um, in certain areas of state, like the panhandle and the keys for uh, frequent utility outages or severe weather. Um, so those are some of the most common reasons we see people choose battery systems. It's important to understand that you will be topping off your battery um, if you choose to add a battery and you will be net metering less. You'll be seeing less excess to the utility company. So you will be getting less credit. So uh, I like to say it like this. Solar is a return on investment. It is a low risk, um, really great investment. You will be paying yourself. Batteries are an insurance plan. So yes, you can have an economic um, payout from batteries in that you may not lose food and you know have, uh, of course, there's no price we can put on our health and safety, um, but generally you're not going to recoup the cost of your battery, uh, which is what would happen uh, with your solar system, it's an investment. Battery is more of an insurance plan. We have an amazing battery storage guide for homeowners, free to download. We have a ton of guides on our website, actually. So definitely check out our website, solarunitedneighbors.org, and just click around. There's so much to learn. We focus, you know, completely on education. Uh, we think that the, the safest consumer is an informed consumer. So if you go to solarunitedneighbors.org forward slash storage, uh, then you can learn about battery storage options. Here's a quick example of a battery storage solution tied with solar. Um, it's important to know that you have to have that solar to be able to recharge the battery. So the battery is only gonna last for about one day if you don't have a solar system that's recharging it. Um, so very often in Florida, hurricanes will take out the grid for a while and then the sun comes back up. So this would be, you know, that's why batteries do work so well for us for emergency preparedness. Um, the, the main point of this slide in this example is for people to understand that most batteries are not whole home solutions. It takes a lot of power to heat things and our air conditioners also take a lot of power. So, with a battery system, you're going to have a separate electrical panel, and that electrical panel is going to be your dedicated load panel. And you're going to pick and choose what you want to run off of that panel um, whenever the grid is down and your battery is running that specific dedicated load panel. Um, in this example, they chose their refrigerator, microwave, internet, some lights, some outlets, and a small um, window unit or mini split. They could not power their electric stove, dryer, and water heater. So something else to keep in mind, um, you can definitely spend extra to do a whole home solution if that's something that you're very passionate about. So this is the last slide and this has been a really long section. The rest of the sections are not as long, um, but there is a lot to understand about solar, right? There are a lot of myths. There are, are a lot of moving parts. This is usually a, a really large contracting um, job for our homes. It's one of the biggest investments we can make in our homes. Um, so let's look at warranties. Solar is heavily warrantied. Solar comes with both a product warranty, like most appliances you would buy, a stove, a washer, a dryer. And that product warranty is, you know, at the minimum we see 10 years, common is 12, 15, 20, uh, all the way up to 30 year product warranties. And that covers um, against any manufacturer defects. It covers against, um, you know, it holding up to the specifications uh, that it's rated for like hail ratings and salt spray ratings. So a strong product warranty from the manufacturer. Um, you also will have a production warranty from the manufacturer. So this is commonly pointed to as the lifetime of solar. 
you may hear that solar lasts for 25 years. Um, that is really a misnomer because it's just pointing to the production warranty. And that production warranty at minimum is 80% at 25 years. So it will be producing 80% of its rated power capacity at the 25 year mark. Most of these are linear. Um, so they'll have a step zone in between there, like at 10 years, it'll still be at 90%. We commonly see 90% at 30 years um, as the technology has improved slightly over the last couple of decades. So um, after, let's say you have a panel that's rated to be producing at 90% of its rated uh, power capacity at 30 years, after that, it's not um, going to fall off of a cliff and completely stop working. It's a one to 3% degradation on average per year. So I've personally seen solar systems over in Brevard County, Florida, which was a very early adopter, um, the Space Coast, and they have been, you know, 50 plus years old. So sometimes, you know, you, you might only be producing 50% or less at that point, but still solar lasts for an extremely long time. So product warranty, production warranty, and then you also have a warranty from your installer called a workmanship or an installation warranty. And that covers, you know, their electrical work, their wiring, um, mounting it to your roof, all of those things. Um, installers in Florida do have to have an EC, an electrical contractor license, or a CVC, a solar contractor license. Um, these are skilled professionals and um, are, you know, really craftsmen at installing these systems. Homeowners insurance. Right now we're in a homeowners insurance crisis in Florida um, and you know, there's a lot that could be said about homeowners insurance, but the main thing that we see with homeowners insurance is that, you know, you're putting this something they consider a fixed asset on your home and it will add value to your home. So you need to make sure that you have enough coverage for that new home value. Let's say your home is worth $200,000 and you're covered at 205. If you add a solar system, then you are going to want to bump up your coverage amount to reflect that new home value from adding the solar system. Uh, definitely be in communication with your homeowner's insurance, make sure it's covered under your hurricane deductible and um, you know is good and ready to go and you have the proper rider for your um, solar being added to your homeowner's insurance. Uh, another consideration for insurance is if you have something um, that's considered a larger system, which is 11.7, kilowatts DC or 10 kilowatts AC alternating current um, or larger then that's considered a larger system um, for not really any scientific reason um, and you would need for many utilities an umbrella policy. Uh, this is something that should be really cheap like less than $100 per year and um, just in uh, an umbrella policy that you know adds liability insurance for uh, your solar. There are not any liability risks with solar, but this is just a odd requirement. Um, what we would say is a barrier that we have here in Florida. You can add other things to your umbrella policy. You may already have one for a boat or an RV, um, so, or your pool, or if you host a bunch of you know, events at your home. So you can definitely wrap it into that or add other things. A lot of people choose to you know, kind of add things as they're doing that. Maintenance, as I mentioned before, you, know, you wanna be thinking about the age of your roof and um, watching out for pollen, but there's generally very little maintenance with your solar system uh, because there are no moving parts with the panel. Uh, most of the maintenance is going to occur, you know, uh, between 10 and 20 years with your inverters. Those are the brains of the operation and they have actual, um, you know, Wi-Fi cards and and computer parts in them. So uh, that's usually where the maintenance does occur. Um, and those inverters also have um, long product warranties as well. So anywhere from 10 to, to 25 um, year warranties on those inverters. How long do systems last? Again, we point to 25 or 30 years as a 
as a lifetime because of the warranty, but they continue to last after that. Will my HOA allow solar on my home? We are very lucky here in Florida, we have something called the Florida Solar Rights Law. And that says that your homeowners association um, can have an aesthetic input, but cannot harm the production of your system. So if their input is, oh, it can't be on the street facing side of your roof, but that's your south facing roof, then that's a no-go. Um, the law protects you because that is uh, the highest production roof plane for you. Generally, what we see is HOAs ask for any conduit run to be painted the same color as the home. If you're in a historic district, especially if you have a historic roof, uh, they do have a little bit more input, but we have um, most historic ARC guidelines or architectural review committee guidelines are um, solar friendly or try to find uh, workarounds for people to be able to go solar in historic districts. And I'll share our email at the end of this webinar and you can definitely um, reach out to us if you have any issues. We've worked with historic districts and HOAs all around the state. All right, solar economics. This is everyone's um, favorite section. Uh, we focus heavily on making sure that we are sharing consumer protection and best practices for financing because we think that everyone has a role to play in this new energy system and it needs to be fair and equitable. Um, so we're always viewing things through a lens of equity and how we can um, move the needle towards energy equity here in Florida and something that we like to call energy democracy where everyone has a stake in this new energy system. So we, that being said, we believe solar is a fit for most families. Um, today, the, the price of solar has dropped 50% just in the last decade. Um, there is a lot of new changes, uh, which are really exciting as far as a tax credit that's available. And, um, and then specifically some financing offerings here in our state. And then our work through solar co-op, we um, do these co-op programs, these projects that are community-based to help lower the soft cost of going solar and make solar more affordable for more families. Um, so we try to lower the cost for both the installer and then they can pass that along and offer the most competitive bid for our co-op members. So the federal tax credit was um, just extended and expanded back to 30%. Um, retroactive for all of this year through the Inflation Reduction Act. So we're really excited about that. Um, the federal tax credit is a tax credit, not a deduction. So you do have to have a tax liability to be able to take it. Uh, we can't offer tax advice, um, but we encourage you to um, look at the IRS website. The form is extremely simple. They have about a two-pager instructions form that explains how you take it or talk to a family financial planner. Oftentimes you can speak with one through your local United Way um, for free around tax time or your CPA about if you would qualify for this tax credit. It's important to know that going into a solar proposal if you think that you may be able to qualify or not. So again, you do have to have tax liability to take the tax credit. Something really exciting is that um, the tax credit is now available to nonprofits who are tax exempt organizations. So municipal governments, schools, domestic violence shelters, any nonprofit can now take that 30% tax credit. Very exciting. So going back to something that we talked about earlier about having um, panels that can look the same, be the same physical size, but be different wattages based on the amount of silicon cells that are inside of them. This is an example of that exact, exact situation. So both of these homes have 26 panels. However, one is a system size of eight kilowatts and then the other is 6.7 kilowatts. And then the main thing that we wanna zoom in on here for your understanding of the pricing and sizing is that you know it really doesn't matter how big your home is it matters how much electricity you use 
And um, in this example on the left-hand side, um, that is only going to cover, even though it's a larger system, it's eight kilowatts, 40% of their usage. So they may have four teenagers at home. Um, on the other side, it may be just a two family household. This is going to cover the 6.7 kilowatt system is gonna cover 100% of their usage. So we always encourage energy efficiency while you're investigating going solar. We call it sealing your envelope. Um, making sure that you know you are making whatever AE um, energy efficiency upgrades or investments make sense uh, for your family, and then thinking about what size solar system is going to give me the best bang for my buck. So here's some example pricing. Um, if you look at the three columns with different sizes, a four kilowatt system is going to be a small system. Eight kilowatt is about average for Florida. And then um, you can see the, the larger system is a 12 kilowatt system. So in this example pricing, um, the average Florida solar co-op pricing is 225 a watt. It is higher outside of the co-op and we'll talk more in section three about what that co-op model is and you know how it, it reduces the price for going solar. And then if you wanna think about uh, the federal tax credit here, uh, that's laid out for you in that in that row. But again, make sure that you believe you would qualify for that. Um, so the net cost, if we look at that average, that middle column for an eight kilowatt system would be 12,600. So um, estimated year one electricity savings is over a thousand dollars. And how does that happen? How do you save immediately? Uh, that's because you're going to be staying in that lower tier of billing. You're going to be immune to rate increases. You're going to have what we call a levelized cost of energy because now you're producing and making and consuming your own energy. Um, and then that's going to continue to grow as rate increases continue to happen, especially with natural gas volatility. And then, um, you know, uh, both rate increases and then your, your own inflation and your own investment coming back to you, your savings are gonna be cumulative over and, and grow um, over 25 years, if we look at that 25 year lifespan. So taking away the cost of the system, your net profit for that middle column, again, example, would be almost $28,000. So as I said earlier, uh, solar is a return on investment. It is a great investment that we can make in our homes. Uh, this is an example of South Florida pricing. It's about 249 a watt. Um, so this is gonna be true for both the Panhandle and South Florida. Uh, we see higher pricing there and that's because of the stricter wind code requirements. So solar is very safe. It is very regulated and um, is not gonna act as a sale or rip up your roof or anything like that whatsoever. Um, but sometimes if you, you know, have specific additional uh, permitting requirements, you're gonna see an increased cost. And we want that. We want that because we want the safest, best engineered systems. So that was examples um, for cash purchasing. Obviously, if you are going to be using a loan, then you have to be thinking about origination fees and interest fees and, um, you know, the different interest rate that you can get. Um, so this is a loan purchase example. Uh, we see a lot of people use home equity lines of credit or HELOC. Those can be very low interest. Um, they can also, the interest paid on those can um, usually be deducted on your taxes if you itemize. Uh, credit unions are a really great option as well. So this is an example of um, a monthly loan payment and then your net profit. The lower your monthly payment is, is um, usually that equates to a longer loan term, um, which can be more interest paid. So that's something to think about too. A lot of these options are not gonna have a prepayment penalty though. 
So that's something that you want to look into if there's a prepayment penalty and kind of plan that out. Uh, the simplest way that we put this is you want, if you're going to have a loan, um, you want to have a loan payment amount that is equivalent to or less than what you currently pay on for your utility bill monthly. So in your head, it would be about the same as your utility bill. Let's say you pay around 150 a month. Um, so shoot for a loan payment amount that's around that. Let's say it's a 10 year loan. And then after 10 years, you don't have the loan payment and you have all of that savings just going into your pocket. There are a lot of financing options and we're really excited about this webpage that we worked really hard to put together. Um, that webpage is solarunitedneighbors.org forward slash financing. That is going to be a national page that you land on and you'll learn um, about you know, national options. And then you can scroll down, click on the state of Florida and see some Florida specific options as well. So some of those first things that you're gonna see are home equity lines of credit, um, maybe refinancing your mortgage. Uh, there's installer financing options. It's a third party financing company, but they very often partner with installers, uh, banks and credit unions. Again, if you scroll down, click on Florida, then you'll see these that are listed here under that bullet point of banks and credit unions, like Seacoast Bank, Climate First Bank, Clean Energy Credit Union. Um, and then the last bullet point here is actually a CDFI, a nonprofit credit union um, called Solar Energy Loan Fund or SELF for short, that's available in Florida specifically, they're Florida based. And we partner with them heavily. Um, they are an amazing nonprofit that is tr trying um, to help increase energy equity and resiliency. They offer both energy efficiency, resiliency, um, like hurricane shutters and solar loans. So lots to check out there. All right, last section. Uh, this is really exciting for us to share because we're so passionate about our work. Uh, we organize these projects around the state called Solar Co-op. Uh, solar Co-op is a group of neighbors coming together um, anywhere from you know 30 to 250 neighbors. We do cap them for um, control measures. Um, and it's usually based on the county or maybe two counties together. A group of neighbors coming together, learning about solar, joining this co-op, it's free to join, no obligation to go solar, and getting the best quote for systems that they can get um, through a competitive bidding process. And then going solar together. So it's super exciting. Uh, why join a co-op? It's free, it's low risk. It's also the best value on your installation. Yes, you will save money, but you will also have the support of your neighbors, maybe a neighbor who's literally on the same street as you, and you'll have our handholding and protection throughout the whole process. Um, you get to connect with fellow solar enthusiasts from around the county. Uh, you may go to the same church. You may be, you know, both EV owners and start an EV club or join the local EV club together, um, EV being electric vehicle. So we just think that there's, you know, such a community here that um, we serve to connect. And then you become a part of this larger statewide and national movement that we're facilitating. So as I said, um, we do a competitive bidding process for these projects. You will sign an individual contract but you're gonna get the most bang for your buck because we put out a very in-depth request for proposals to local installers um, from around the state. Although the majority of solar crops do choose a local installer that's kind of like in their backyard. And then you members of the co-op who have a vested interest here, volunteer to serve on a selection committee. We're vendor neutral. We present all of the information in an apples to apples um, fashion, and then the co-op members choose the installer. So of course, we're there to help answer any questions, um, but it really is a grassroots driven process. So how does this whole co-op process work? We open co-ops um, around the state, and the first thing to do is to attend one of these info sessions. We have these um, for all of our co-ops, 
or if you're lucky enough to catch it during Florida Climate Week. Um, and then you learn about going solar and the process of it. You look on our website, um, solarunitedneighbors.org forward slash Florida to see if there's a local co-op near you that's open. Sign up. It's completely free to join and it's not an obligation to go solar. And then you invite your neighbors, post on next door or, you know, ask us for a flyer and share that at, you know, whatever clubs you're a part of. So the co-ops are open for people to join for about three months for 250 members. And then once we have over 30 um, members who, you know, have joined, we do a free roof review. As soon as you join, we give you some feedback. Hey, I think your roof looks great. Or, wow, you have way too much shading. This is going to be a bad investment for you. Don't do it. Um, or I have some questions, but uh, let's get the installer to take a, a closer look once they're selected. Um, so we give you real feedback immediately. Uh, once we have 30 people join that are either qualified or maybe qualified, um, then we put out this very, very in-depth, we've done hundreds of these, request for proposals to installers around the state. Installers then um, can choose to respond if they would like to submit a bid for the co-op to be the installer to service the co-op. They put their best foot forward and then we ask any questions that we have, we check their licensure, their workers' comp insurance, reviews, um, do about a bunch of background checking. And then we lay out the bids in an apples to apples comparison and volunteers to have said, hey, I wanna be on the selection committee, come together and review all of the bids. We're there to handhold and support through the process. And then they select one installer in a democratic process um, to service the whole co-op. We lock that installer into servicing the co-op in a legal agreement, and then they begin reaching out to co-op members, offering customizable proposals. We're here to help you read your proposal, um, help you with, you know, understanding the financing options that are available to you, and so on and so forth. And then everyone signs an individual contract if you want to. Um, generally, anywhere from 20 to 50% of the co-op will sign a contract and move forward. And um, then you have your install. We might come out, watch the install happen, take some pictures afterwards. Um, and then we try to have either a virtual meetup or an in-person party for everyone to get um, together and kind of meet each other and say, hey, I went solar, oh, I chose this package, um, or I didn't go, I think next year is gonna look better for me and just kind of meet and mingle with the community uh, that was your solar co-op. So what's next? Um, we have open co-ops right now. We have open co-ops in South Florida, Palm Beach County just opened, um, but you know this, this webinar is evergreen and it's gonna be around for a long time. So I encourage everybody to go to our website, solarunitedneighbors.org forward slash Florida, look and see what co-ops are open near you. Um, again, they're open to join for free for three months and then the rest of the project steps start happening. Um, so you wanna be checking to see if there's a co-op near you. We also have a wait list that you can join to be alerted if a co-op opens in your zip code. Um, so that's something that you wanna investigate as well. It's solarunitedneighbors.org forward slash wait list. And like I said earlier, there's a bunch of open source material consumer protection, FAQs, and free guides on our website. So check it out and share this webinar with your friends and see what else um, is going on for Florida Climate Week. Check out some other webinars and be sure to share those too. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us at Florida team at solarunitedneighbors.org. Thank you so much for being a part of Florida Climate Week. And thank you to the Volo Foundation for putting this on every year.